north. The storm that we see in the satellite picture looks like it's out there all by itself, but it really isn't. It's embedded in an atmosphere that's composed of a lot of other features. Another one of those features, the high-level jet stream winds, which weakened Floyd as it moved toward the east coast. The jet stream winds are a very large-scale influence. They're like a river of air. The jet stream actually blew the top off of the hurricane and distorted its perfect spiral shape, which is what normally allows the air in it to gather so much force. That meant that when the storm finally made landfall in North Carolina Thursday morning, its winds had dropped to 110 miles an hour, much lower than the 150 mile an hour winds that whipped across the Bahamas. But if the U.S. mainland escaped some of the wind, it did not avoid the water. Floyd produced a storm surge of floodwaters that reached miles inland. The surge of the water coming in ahead, we're talking about 10 to 13 feet possibly, uh, that's uh, bigger than we've had in the past. A storm surge is caused by the extreme low pressure in the center of a hurricane. The low pressure acts like a vacuum, sucking ocean water in from the surrounding area and creating a mound of water that crashes ashore along with the storm, forcing residents to flee to higher ground. He is two and a half months, and Boy. this is his second hurricane already. 1999 has been one of the most active hurricane seasons in years. Hurricane Brett slammed into South Texas in late August. Dennis flirted with the Carolinas for a week before heading out to sea. And now Floyd. We expect this is going to continue. Right now, forecasters are watching Hurricane Gert, which formed off Africa early in the week and is headed across the Atlantic. And the source of all this hurricane activity? You've heard it before, La Nina. Some of the biggest hurricanes that affected the East Coast have been during La Nina summers. During El Nino years, the jet stream takes a southerly path across the United States. It interferes with hurricane formation in the tropical Atlantic, making for relatively quiet conditions. But La Nina pushes the jet stream winds to the north, allowing hurricanes to form and drift westward without interruption. But it's not the only thing that's happening. We also have a warm tropical Atlantic. That, combined with the winds in the Atlantic, give us a set of conditions that are very favorable for the formation of tropical storms and hurricanes. And it's far from over. The midpoint of the hurricane season was only a week ago, and forecasters expect that the second half will be just as active as the first. Ned Potter, ABC News. When we come back, from outer space to the eye of the storm. This season, the dramatic length scientists go to to track a killer hurricane. Load gauges, wind monitors, and strain sensors. A unique research site. They interact. The models have made a huge difference to the job of forecasting, but even with all that computers can do, predicting hurricanes remains an inexact science. Category 5 hurricane, Category 4 hurricane, one of the things that is relatively weak in the forecasting skill today is to say how strong is it going to be. And not able to uh, predict with a high degree of confidence how the intensity is going to change. For the most part though, Floyd matched the meteorologist forecasts. Millions saw this, a monster of a storm moving their way and they headed inland. It was the power of prediction in the face of one very powerful storm. Bob Woodruff, ABC News, Miami, Florida. Coming up, the home built to be battered. In an extreme experiment, scientists wire. But this century alone, there have been dozens of hurricanes even stronger and more deadly, including one hurricane with no name that killed 8,000 people. Ned Potter reports. On the morning of September 8th, 1900, Galveston, Texas was one of the richest cities in the United States, filled with mansions and some 40,000 residents. But that night, a hurricane struck the city with diabolical force. My grandfather said it sounded like a thousand demons screaming in the night. Linda McDonald, who lives in Galveston today, learned of fear of hurricanes from her grandfather. He survived the 1900 storm. He said he could hear children calling for their mothers and he would hear women screaming for help and he'd hear men begging for mercy from God. 
Thomas Edison sent a film crew to capture these rare images. As many as 8,000 people were killed and 3,000 homes destroyed. There had been almost no warning and no evacuation. It is still the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. Horror was piled upon horror. A Catholic orphanage had stood on the beachfront. Ninety children were dead. The sisters had tried to save the children by tying them to themselves and each sister tied to herself between six and eight children. What made the Galveston hurricane so lethal was its storm surge, a near biblical deluge of water driven by low air pressure and 100 mile an hour winds. The most dangerous thing about any hurricane is the storm surge. Eric Larson has written about the lessons of the Galveston disaster. It was the Galveston hurricane that really for the first time taught the Weather Bureau that the thing you want to worry about in a hurricane is not the wind per se, it's the storm surge. A storm surge can be a hurricane's brass knuckles landing its most vicious punches. In 1938, a storm surge savaged the northeast coast, flooding Providence, Rhode Island. A hurricane in New England. 31 years later, Hurricane Camille drove a 20-foot tidal wave onto the Mississippi coast, killing 250 people. And in 1989, Hugo's storm surge hammered Charleston, South Carolina, in what was then the costliest storm in history. But no storm surge in the United States has rivaled the sheer destruction of Galveston. Galveston, although no one seemed to realize at the time, was acutely suited to a really devastating storm surge. Galveston was defenseless before the approaching hurricane, a city at sea level with no seawall and with treacherously shallow coastal waters. The beach is a long, shallow slope, perfect for having this, having this storm surge come along and build and build and build, kind of, like, kind of like Godzilla climbing out of the harbor. After Galveston, the hurricane continued its rampage. A low pressure system sucked the hurricane north, slicing across the entire United States. By the time it hit Buffalo, New York, it was back at hurricane speed, 75 mile an hour winds. When this storm was in Nova Scotia, midtown Manhattan, New York was getting 60 mile an hour winds from the storm system. It was that massive a system. I mean, to me, the most obvious lesson you'd learn after a catastrophe like that is don't live near the sea. Bill Reed is a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. Although Galveston is now protected with a seawall and scientists can better predict a hurricane's arrival, a mighty storm surge would still be devastating. Now we have all this development along Galveston Bay. We have up to a quarter of the nation's refining capability or in plants that are along Galveston Bay. We have the Johnson Space Center. It's along Galveston Bay. And we have several hundred thousand people live in communities that are in the potential storm surge zone. And do they all know that they're in the threat zone? I'm not sure. Linda McDonald says Hurricane Floyd reminds her of her grandfather and why he retold the story of the deadliest natural disaster in America's history. My grandfather said that when you know what happened in Galveston during the 1900 storm, then every night before you go to bed, you hug your family. Then you thank God, because it could all be changed. It could all be gone overnight, the way it was that weekend in September in 1900. 99 years ago this month, Ned Potter, ABC News. That's all for this special edition of the program. I'm Steve Avison. Join us next week for more Discovery News.